I've been asked to start the program right at four, five, 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 four, five, so it's time. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jonah Rai. Uh, Deepak Zee from Social Science Baha have generously asked me to moderate the, uh, today's lecture. Uh, so without any delay and without any other rituals, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our speaker for today. Uh, so if anyone outside, you can come inside. Please uh, do come inside with your tea if you want to have your tea. Uh, am I? So soon inside, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, so there are some people who may have uh, problem on staff, who may not be as uh, competent in Nepali, so I'm going to use English uh, as a medium of you know, introduction. Uh, but uh, later in the discussion, if you want, uh, you can also ask Erika uh, in Nepali. Uh, she will try to, you know, I, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll try to work out with that. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Erika Hoffman, Dilloway, and I'm also happy to say that you know she's also my friend. Uh, we went to the same school uh, for our PhD, uh, PhD, uh, PhD. Uh, so that's also another kinship uh, uh, and a happy moment to be uh, here uh, sitting by uh, next to her. Uh, Erika has, uh, you know, uh, Erika has been working in Nepal for long since 1997, um, uh, uh, then, you know, so, so her affiliation and her uh, continued love and you know, uh, involvement in Nepal uh, is uh, uh, long, and she has been working uh, with, particularly with the deaf communities of Nepal, uh, and, you know, there are different uh, dimensions of their, you know, sign language, uh, the language of the deaf community. Uh, she is a Professors and a previous chair of anthropology at Oberlin College, Ohio, USA. Uh, she has been conducting research with deaf singers in Nepal since 1997, as uh, I mentioned earlier. And she has a book published in 2016 from how do you pronounce it? I mean, like Galera. Galera. Yeah. Uh, I came to know that Galera is a university that uh, you know uh, promotes the education for deaf and special people. Uh, and I think you know, that's why, you know, I think the book publication from that university uh, means a lot I think, in that for Eric and for the other uh, that community as well. And she has been writing uh, about, she has many publications, published in, in a renowned international uh, journal, for example, Journal of Linguistic Anthropology uh, on, on, on various topics, uh, and I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, detail all her work. But few things that I want to mention is that, you know, uh, her work, particularly on, on deaf community, is one of the pioneering works in Nepal in that field. And she has been, you know, uh, her work has shown how, you know, uh, deaf communities, uh, what are the, you know, some of the political, uh, 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 cultural politics of language and language ideology uh, within the deaf communities and how that relates to Nepal's larger, you know, uh, political changes and uh, politics of identity, including ethnic identity. Uh, and many of us may not be aware, but her work shows that how even the deaf community were claiming an, an ethnic identity uh, for the fact that they have a distinct language. If you know, even if they belong to, uh, from different communities, uh, you know, they belong to a, a single you know linguistic community. And in Nepal, in you know, language, uh, you know, having a language, a distinct language, is one of the major ways of defining an ethnic group in Nepal. And. Um, and she has published uh, some other works. And uh, beside Nepal, she has been also she has also worked and done field work in Europe, in Malta, in Germany. Uh, and uh, now her works, as the, uh, you know, today's talk she was going to highlight, is focusing more on you know, images and you know uh, visuals. Graphic. With that short uh, introductions, uh, I'd like to request uh, Erika to the uh, Professor Erika Hoffman deliver for your talk. We have about 45 minutes. Namaste. To pay the lay, malay the long bio. Just for the key, teddy teddy on your buttons. Like you should have. Mero Anushan then, and the Palma Pachis Barsha Agi should have bio. And it's your Benedicti, teddy teddy manche hurule, malay mudded corn bio. Bayer a manche hurule, Nepali anthropologist hurule, the Arco Kali hurule, malay mudded corn bio. 
Uh, so, and I'm afraid I have to give the rest of the talk in English. <laughs> On a chilly winter day in 2017, I joined a group of elderly deaf Nepalis for a meeting of the Older and Vulnerable Deaf Persons Project, or ODP. This program, which was hosted by the Kathmandu Association of the Deaf, provided material, social, and linguistic support to older deaf Nepalis, many of whom had not previously had an opportunity to fully acquire conventional signed or spoken languages. Leaders of the KAD established this program to help provide all deaf Nepalis an opportunity to participate in a deaf social life grounded in the use of Nepali Sign Language, or NSL. Though the room that day was cold enough that many of us were wearing coats and knit caps, we had been warmed up by a round of hot tea and some kaja prepared in the KAD's kitchen. As the plates were gathered up for washing, the ODP instructor, a deaf NSL signer who I'll hear call Rohan, waited to attract our attention to the whiteboard at the front of the room. While we had been eating, he had been drawing a large landscape with erasable markers. The image complete with mountains, a river, a small house, and other details typical of a Nepali village scene. Distributing paper and markers to our group, he enjoined us to each copy the landscape as accurately as we could. We bent to the task with Rohan checking our progress and assisting those of us who needed help. As the drawing on this slide suggests, the room in which we were gathered provided rather spectacular evidence that the production of pictorial images was a regular ODP activity. The walls were covered in bright drawings of fruits, household objects, cartoon characters, human faces, etc., created by the participants from example templates offered by their instructors. In this talk, I'll discuss how such activities were a part of the ODP pedagogy, which helped deaf elders cultivate the skills involved in learning conventional NSL signs. Local understandings of NSL as a governmentally and socially recognized language have in part been grounded in pictorial illustrations of signers performing standardized lexical items in sign language dictionaries, posters, and primers. Visually parsing and physically reproducing the content of such illustrations has thus been an important component of bringing into being a type of deaf social life grounded in the performance of socially legitimized sign language forms. That said, <laughs> what does reproducing a drawing of a landscape have to do with reproducing signs that appear in NSL dictionaries? The primary point of such exercises wasn't to provide training in art skills per se, though the potential enjoyment involved in making art was certainly part of what the group wanted to provide to the elders. Rather, by encouraging participants to create reproductions of a visual prompt, the drawing exercises scaffolded subsequent activities in which participants were given the more complicated task of reproducing by signing the standardized NSL signs appearing in the dictionaries, and as we'll see, as modeled in NSL narrative genres provided by the ODP instructor. Drawing on ethnographic research conducted in the ODP in 2015 and 2017, supplemented by the long-term research I've been conducting in the call with signers since 1997, in this talk, I describe specifically how engagement with pictorial images in the ODP helped deaf elders cultivate the skills involved in performing standard NSL signs. I'll also show that the elders' image-making practices in these classes exceeded the relatively narrow vision of deaf modes of meaning-making that were presented in dictionaries and related texts. Analysis of these dynamics helps us consider what is obscured when language and image are defined in opposition to one another, and helps us build a more nuanced view of how language relates to other kinds of semiosis or meaning making. In so doing, this work draws on and contributes to an emerging linguistic anthropology of images, uh, an area which applies the tools of linguistic anthropology, which is usually about studying language use in context, to the study of images not in order to purify and isolate either language or image as objects of study, but to help understand the semiotic principles and relations that apply across and break down the rigidity of such categories. And here I'm paraphrasing the causes. Also to this end, rather than relying solely on conventional written transcriptions or photographic or video images, in this research project, I follow my deaf Nepali colleagues' lead 
by myself making drawing a tool for generating and communicating my own claims about language. So you'll be seeing images that I made throughout the talk. And the presentation will conclude with a discussion of the increasing use of graphic methods for generating, reflecting, and circulating analyses in anthropology and other social sciences. So, what are the categorical distinctions that are often made between language and image that a linguistic anthropology of images seeks to reconsider? In many, though certainly not all, ideological contexts, Linguistic and imagistic properties are defined in opposition to one another, with language associated with speech, abstractness, linearity, segmentability, mediation, and symbolic properties, while images are associated with visuality, materiality, simultaneity, holism, immediacy, and iconic properties. Ethnographic contexts centering on deaf signers provide a setting where the stakes of this kind of misunderstanding of the relationship between language and image are particularly clear. In many social and historical contexts, scholarly and popular perspectives have treated sign languages as being somehow outside the province of language. This exclusion was foundational, for example, to structural linguistics, with Saussure stating that sound was the, quote, natural bond connecting signifier and signified. Further, Saussure's claims aligning sound with arbitrariness accompanied inaccurate presumptions about visual signs, namely that they are limited to concrete phenomena and incapable of expressing abstract concepts. And they're important from Bauman. However, in the 1960s, oh, it's yes, In the 1960s, drawing on structural linguistic theory, Stokey demonstrated that sign languages are made up of units and structural relations that characterize spoken languages as well, like duality of patterning and morphosyntax. Indeed, linguists now recognize that sign languages are as fully linguistic as spoken languages, and that visual spatial modes of communication can express the full complexity of human experience. Indeed, Nepali linguists such as Shilu Sharma, who is here with us today, hi, uh, have demonstrated the linguistic properties of Nepali sign language specifically. Nevertheless, Sign modes of communication have been, and in some contexts are still, framed in both scholarly and popular perspectives as non-linguistic on the basis of being considered overly imagistic. For example, when deaf Nepalis communicate through visual manual modalities, until relatively recently they have been understood by many hearing Nepalis not to be using language, but rather what is locally called natural sign. Unlike modes of communication recognized as linguistic, Natural sign is framed as needing neither, quote, history or community to work, as self-evident, emerging unmediated from deaf people's experiential state, and is demonstrating neither more nor less than the universal human capacities to find meaning in the visual contours of the world. And there I'm citing from Peter Grave, another anthropologist who studies this, this same group of signers. Now, deaf activism has sought to revise these inaccurate assumptions. The Kathmandu Association of the Deaf, which hosted the, K the ODP, was formed in 1980. From that time on, the KAD served as a space from which signers could gather to socialize and advocate for recognition of NSL as language. In 1995, the National Federation of the Deaf Nepal was established as an umbrella institution that organized what had grown to be 44 partner associations of deaf people around the country. The Federation has overseen the collection and standardization of Nepali sign language lexical items and reinforces the use of these signs through their publication in dictionaries, posters, and primers. Perhaps counterintuitively, given the common dichotomization of language and image that I just mentioned, these texts have centered drawings of signs. The production of such texts have helped legitimate signing practices as a collection of founded and discrete words, making them legible to powerful stakeholders like the state, into international organizations and the hearing public. The photos on this slide show the current presidents of each institution, as well as, again, interpreter and linguist Shilu Sharma, who remain involved in progress, pro project, the projects focused on sign ratification and sign language advocacy, about which I'm continuing to conduct new research. Pratika Shakya, a deaf Nepali artist, uh, and in this case, I'm not using a pseudonym, uh, and I'll use his last name as I continue to distinguish the, his name from those for whom I am using uh, pseudonyms. 
was recruited to provide illustrations for these texts. His work is not restricted to just illustrating dictionaries. Um, for example, in response to global and local stigma associated with deafness and sign languages, Shakya has produced and circulated hundreds, maybe more, drawings uh, and paintings which extol the virtues of signing in a deaf community. In this talk, however, I will focus primarily on his pictorial representations of the signed lexicon, again, in these dictionaries, primers, and posters that are widely distributed to schools for deaf students and associations of deaf persons in Nepal. And I'll just note that sometimes these images are painted as murals rather than printed in dictionaries. So just to contextualize a little bit, um, here's a brief video clip in which uh, Shaka says, hello, namaste, welcome, this place is called Sherakot. I've traveled here, you can see a nice view. This school here has been rebuilt following the earthquake. My responsibility has been painting, come and see. And then as we can see here, the, the drawings take the form of illustrations of persons performing the signs, often clustered with pictorial representations of what the signs represent. So somebody performing the sign hati, a picture of a hati, and written Nepali or English translation of the signs names as well. Robust NSL-mediated networks of deaf sociality have emerged from these sites of activism and education and legal and social recognition of NSL as one of Nepal's national languages has steadily increased since the publication of these materials. These image-laden texts have been an effective way to advocate for recognition of NSL as a language. Due to a range of social and geographical factors, however, not all deaf Nepalis have had an opportunity to learn to sign. These factors include the fact that because most deaf people are born into hearing families, and due to the social stigma that may in some contexts be associated with deafness, deaf people don't necessarily have the chance to encounter one another. Further, the first school for deaf students in Nepal wasn't established until the 1960s. So while some deaf Nepalis ha are currently able to attend a sign language medium school from an early age, older deaf Nepalis had no such opportunity. These circumstances make elder deaf people vulnerable not only to the effects of restricted access to conventionalized language that they experienced, but also to the ways in which lack of access to language restricted their access to a wide range of social, educational, and economic resources and roles. The aim of the ODP was to provide the rich sign language-based socialization and support that these elders had thus missed. These efforts were centered on language instruction. The next section of this talk will closely detail an ODP session, exploring the role that engagement with pictorial images play in ODP language pedagogy. So, as mentioned earlier, ODP sessions included drawing activities in which participants were asked to reproduce pictorial prompts provided by their instructor. The elders were encouraged to copy the images that the instructors provided as precisely as possible. This approach to drawing instruction is not unusual in Nepal, where artistic practices often center on upholding prescribed conventions. The processes through which people parse and reproduce representational drawings are mediated by local convention and entail complex learned linkages between visual and rhetoric systems. For example, perceiving a drawn image does not necessarily entail knowing how to reproduce it, right? Uh, what, what are the physical motions you have to make? And we've all tried to draw something that we've seen and, and failed, so I think we all have that experience. Mm -hmm. um, in the ODP, as in many other pedagogical approaches to teaching art, participants learn such schemas and production scripts through imitation of external graphic sources with support from instructors. So to return to the afternoon I've been describing, once our snack break was over, Rohan asked us to copy the landscape drawing he had created. While most ODP members copied this image um, easily on the afternoon in question, others did require support. For example, one participant sort of stalled out after making a few lines <clears throat> and waited for Rohan's attention. Once he had finished checking the other participant's progress, Rohan sat behind, beside this participant and taking his hand in his own, led him through the movements that were involved in drawing out the scene. 
In so doing, he provided both visual and motor feedback about the sort of movement production script required to reproduce this drawing. Once we had completed the landscape exercise, Rohan asked us to turn to the dictionary chapter, listing, or primer chapter, listing signs whose Nepali equivalent terms began with the Devanagari letter Ka, and requested that we each take a turn rep performing the signs that were represented therein. As when reproducing the landscape drawing, participants had to learn a sequenced movement scripts through which these represented signs could be reproduced. In both cases, what was at issue was not just perceiving the visual form, but also understanding the temporally unfolding movements through which a reproduction of that form could be composed. That said, the exercise focusing on copying the landscape scaffolded exercises focused on reproducing signs because of the significant additional complexities that were entailed in copying a, um, a drawing by enacting the movements that it depicts, rather than reproducing its form on paper with a marker. Among these challenges was uh, the necessity to transform a static two-dimensional image into four-dimensional movements. This kind of imitation hinges on parsing the details of the pictorial representation, which could require significant interpretive work. But this also hinged on the participants needing to calibrate their own sense of their bodily movements and position through space to match this visual target. Signers are not usually looking at their own bodies when they're signing, so it's not just about matching how one thing looks to how another thing looks, but matching how it feels to perform the movements to what the target sh sign shape will look like to others. Unsurprisingly, signs made up of actions that resembled activities with which the students, the elders, were already familiar were often easiest to parse and reproduce visually. So for example, the recent activity of the drawing exercise grounded the participants' interpretation and reproduction of the sign for Kalam or pen. On the afternoon in question, Rohan gave us each time to attempt to independently parse and reproduce um, the signs, and then checked to see if they were well formed. Rohan noticed that one participant was having some difficulty parsing the representation of the sign turtle, which you can see here. He was using his entire right hand rather than just his thumb to represent the turtle's head peeking out of its shell. As shown in this drawing, Rohan then knelt before the participant and repeatedly performed the target sign himself. Thus, the participant was encouraged to relate the static drawn model with a co-present, dynamically moving model. Exercises centered on NSL primers required another skill not involved in the drawing activities. Facility with the perspective shifts that are involved in the viewpoint rotation required to reproduce the movements illustrated in the dictionaries from the position of the depicted signer. When we were reproducing the landscape, we were positioned as viewing the scene from a particular vantage point throughout the process, both seeing the initial prompt and then drawing it. However, in the pictorial representations of signers, they're drawn facing the viewer, um, it, a positioning that would be typical when having a signed conversation. To properly reproduce the signs then, we needed to not face the target image, but embody it. Uh, and this requires 180 degree spatial rotation when reproducing signs that are bilaterally asymmetrical. As I've discussed in more detail in, in some previous work, Instruction in the ODP thus often focused on helping participants manage these kinds of viewpoint rotations, which can be challenging for new signers, whether hearing or deaf. By contrast, uh, fluent signers are often really virtuosic with viewpoint rotations, um, something that Shakya sometimes plays with and incorporates into his artwork. So you can see here, he made an image which must be seen in a mirror to be correctly interpreted. And I would be hard pressed to make this easily, but this is something Shakya can do quite easily. On the afternoon I've been describing, while some ODP members easily reproduced the signs from the perspective of the depicted signers, others did in fact struggle with the task. To assist one participant who was struggling, Rohan recruited a young fluent signer who was assisting that day to sit next to the elder and perform the sign in question along with Rohan. So then there were three models scaffolding this performance of the sign. A detailed static drawing, which is handy, hold still, you can look at it and study it a face-to-face -face dynamic model through which the movements were being embodied, and a side-by-side -side model, the copying of which did not require viewpoint rotation. With all of this in place, the elder had a very well-supported opportunity to practice making the depicted form correctly. 
In the final part of the meeting, Rohan stood before the group and modeled a brief narrative, which participants were expected to reproduce. The copying of which, as he faced the class to provide the prompt, also required group rotation. The narrative drew exclusively on Nepali sign language lexical items. So on the afternoon I've been describing, Rohan performed a brief morning routine NSL narrative, describing the actions he had taken that morning. So I've translated his signing as, after waking up, I go use the bathroom, I wash my face, I brush my teeth, then it's time to drink tea, after which I cook and then I work. Rohan then turned to a participant who I'll hear call Radha and signed your, your own, uh, use sign language. That is, he asked her to give an account of her morning activities using the standard signs. By, indeed, by saying your, use sign language, he meant use the standard signs, not other communicative resources that might be available to her, like natural sign, gesture, or voice. This slide provides a comic strip style transcript of her response, which was very successful in the sense that she exclusively used NSL signs and produced them in the same grammatical fashion as Rohan. So she says, you know, in the morning, it's six o'clock, I brush my teeth, I wash my face, I use the bathroom, return, I do those things, wash my hands and cook. <clears throat> my experience drawing Radha's turn highlighted her precision in reproducing the signs as they were modeled in the dictionary and by Rohan. Indeed, because of the extent to which the formal properties of the performance had been shaped by NSL pedagogies grounded in the dictionary's mode of visualizing NSL. Her narrative was relatively pre-adapted to being represented through this kind of pictorial representation. The series of activities, starting from the reproduction of pictorial images and culminating in the reproduction of sign narratives, characterizes ODP approach to NSL instruction. All of these exercises involved various types of transformations of an initial prompt, whether it be the movements of hands, holding crayons, leaving enduring marks on paper, or through relatively more evanescent bodily movements through space. And these real-time traces allow Rohan to intervene when necessary to calibrate elders' performance to poetically align with the target forms. Now, ODP pedagogy takes into account the fact that the elders' relative ease or difficulties with these tasks points to the extent to which those forms align with those they've had experience performing in the past. At the same time, this pedagogy creates a context where elders can cultivate greater experience with visually interpreting and physically reproducing conventional NSL signs, experience they build on in the future. Formally correct performance allow participants to embody the figure of signer that Shakti portrays, in which Rohan himself embodies. The imagistic qualities of NSL in this sense participated in the complex web of processes through which elders who might otherwise have been excluded from a deaf sociality based in NSL were made in the image, so to speak, of competent signers. Such processes highlight the fact that the conventionality treated as a fundamental characteristic of language always hinges on these kinds of imagistic poetics. Conventionalized standard forms in any modality are always reproduced in the image of some model, undermining the simple attempts to dichotomize language and image. However, as the second part of this talk explores, even as the pedagogical goal of ODP instruction was to encourage elders to use standard forms drawn in dictionaries, in practice, other kinds of signing was permitted and even celebrated in the ODP meetings. Signing that was richly pantomimic, drawing on the affordances of the visual manual modality to, resemble, to, create, to highlight resemblance between sign forms and reference, and diagrammatic resemblances in the structure of discourse. While such framing may be framed as natural when produced by those who don't command NSL forms, these practices were also part of the repertoires of fluent NSL signers who built on, decompose, and elaborate on uh, shared conventional sign forms. However, even as such modes of meanings are significant to how deaf Nepalis make meaning together, they exceed the vision of NSL as objectified in the dictionaries, which must appeal to popular ideas of the linguistic in order to combat the notion that sign language is not or not quite language. So let's look at an example of that kind of signing in the ODP, also in response to Rohan's narrative prompt, in this case from an elder I'll call Madhu. While Madhu was encouraged and supported in performing NSL signs during some activities in the ODP, like reciting signs from the primers, there was no expectation that he would use signs in response to Rohan's narrative prompt. Rather, he was largely considered too old, 
He was in his 70s when he was first consistently exposed to conventional language, so to, com to significantly change his communication style, which was largely considered a natural sign. The excerpt I've chosen to discuss here is highly pantomimic, focused on showing rather than telling. For example, unlike in Rada's narrative, in this brief excerpt where Madhu is discussing washing his hands and getting ready to brush his teeth, gradually established certain contours of the space in which he was doing his morning uh, routine, including a location for the sink or water tap, the shelf, and the mirror. It was more challenging for me to represent this narrative in comic format than Rada's, Modeled on previous ODP pedagogy and visual poetics of the dictionary, Rada had performed a series of very discrete signs, each of which took approximately the same amount of time to perform. So it was simple to divide her actions among discrete comic panels, and the implication that each panel represented a, mo a moment of roughly equal length of time was appropriate. The signs Rada performed, though in some cases iconically motivated, were relatively governed by the logic of signs and their combinations. While in Madhu's narrative here, actions were performed in accordance with the spatial and temporal logic of the actions they represented. And there I'm quoting from Green, who's also done work with this group of science. That is, while in Rada's narrative, the poetic focus centered on reproducing signs that resembled sufficiently to instantiate conventional signs, in Madhu's narrative, the poetic focus centered on resemblance to the reference activities. So for example, the motions Badu performed to evoke the acts of washing his hands, brushing his teeth, rinsing his mouth, uh, took roughly amount, the same amount of time it might take to actually execute these tasks. Rather than try to capture this difference by providing like a precise time code for each part of the signing, um, I've evoked the relative differences by extending the length of panels, including relevant movements, and including within them the more complex set of actions entailed. Now, Manu does not simply uh, reenact such signs without artistic license, or I'm sorry, doesn't simply reenact such activities without artistic license. Manu carries on in this moment, enacting brushing his teeth just until his audience members started to get amused by how long he was dragging it out, but also about to lose focus. Uh, and then shifted to portraying himself, studying himself in the mirror, and then briefly resumed brushing, eliciting laughs and groans from his classmates. In this and other instances, the poetics of Madhu's extended embodied repetitions, along with his attunement to an ability to play with audience, audience expectations about timing and pace, intensified the impact of his narrative. Additionally, Madhu joked to me after the class that his lengthy rendition of toothbrushing hadn't been a true reflection of his activities that morning. <laughs> Opening his mouth wide to reveal he really didn't have any teeth left in his advanced age. <laughs> he wasn't simply reenacting his actual morning events, he was crafting an amusing narrative one that was based on conventional expectations about what would happen in the morning routine. Likewise, in this section, he was purposefully seeking to entertain the others, who reacted strongly to his decision to portray efforts to remove phlegm from his throat and nose. Such clearing of the passages can be a part of a typical Nepali morning routine, maybe particularly in rural areas. And while these urban dwellers were less likely, perhaps, to have included this, this activity in their own rituals, Madhu's actions were conventionally recognizable and amusing in their specificity, and to some participants' sensibility to grossness, as the comic strip shows. So Jeevan turns away in mock horror, Rohan glances back to gauge my reaction, and one participant copies Madhu's nose-blowing action while dissolving into laughter. Now, even as Madhu's approach to the narrative exercise broke the rules imposed in the context of a, a standard NSL class, aspect of his narrative strategies uh, resembled those of fluent signers. That is, signing which artfully uh, centers on poetic reproduction of conventionally recognizable actions and forms, rather than on the reproduction of conventionalized linguistic forms per se, is a part of the repertoire of many signers recognized as fluent uh, virtuosic signers of NSL. For example, Pratika Shakya, the artist who created the pictorial representations of NSL for the dictionaries and primaries discussed in the talk, often drew on his skill in producing complex images out of forms that included but were not limited to standard NSL lexical items in his signing practices. I have observed him do so both in face-to-face -face contexts and in videos that he posts to platforms like Facebook. For example, in July 2020, Shakya posted a video discussing the poly basket weaving in use. The video opened with a close-up shot of his hands working on a detailed painting of a woven basket. 
After the camera pulled back to show Shakya's full upper body, he began to sign. This signing was initially centered on standardized forms in which he explained, and you know, this is a kind of Nepali cultural practice that I'm going to inform you about today. But then he transitioned into uh, what we might consider a more pantomimic form of si signing. For example, via what Kushat and Salandra would call transfer of person, Shakya behaved like someone handling dried stalks and weaving them together, as we see here. Then, via transfer of size and form, he transformed his fingers into dried stalks and began to interlace them together with remarkable flexibility into a pattern that mimicked the weave of the basket. characterize these kinds of strategies as constructed action and have demonstrated their linguistic nature in sign languages. Finally, with one hand, uh, he held the completed painting of a basket against his chest and using the other, began to sign about the uses a basket might have, uh, treating the painted image as a ground for his signing hand's standard NSL actions. Um, so signing put in at the mouth of the painted basket, for example. The wide range of semiotic or meaning-making resources he drew on in creating compelling videos like this characterizes, in my experience, his sign more broadly. Shakti was present at the ODP meeting I've been describing, having taken over filming to bring me up to participate. However, at other sessions of the ODP, I was able to observe as he himself took part. Further, he's posted video uh, of his ODP morning routine narrative to his Facebook page, on which the brief transcript here is based. On these occasions, rather than producing an account grounded in the use of standardized NSL sign like Rada was asked to do, and which of course he would have been perfectly capable of doing, Shakya launched into a pantomimic narrative that was a style much more similar to Madhu's. Shakya slowly enacts stretching awake, glancing out the window at the dawn, and washing his face. While Shakya and Madhu's approaches to pantomimic narrative converged in this context, they diverged in others, such as the one we just saw the basket example. The differences between their typical performances relate to those described by Sutton Spence and Voice Brain in a comparison of the performances of hearing mimes and deaf signing poets. The point of these scholars' comparison most relevant to this discussion is that the hearing mimes almost exclusively relied on transfer of person in crafting their enactments, mapping the characters they portrayed onto their full bodies rather than intermixing the strategies with the other kinds of linguistic strategies deaf signers employ. For example, if mimes were representing an elephant, uh, they would use their own legs to show the elephant's legs, uh, never turning their forearms or their fingers into most parts of the elephant's body. Additionally, when the agent they were portraying this matter would interact with other objects, the properties of the objects they interacted with would be shown through handling motions, rather than, again, transforming their body into the handled objects. While deaf poets, on the other hand, do this much wider range of strategy, become the object, don't just do handling. Sutton Spence and Voice Brain suggest that this variation may derive from the different audiences to whom hearing minds and signing poets are typically addressing themselves. That is, non-signing hearing audiences are most likely to be able to parse and interpret and make sense of a performer's <coughs> movements when those actions relate to those that the audience themselves has embodied experience making. Recall the point of the above that it was easier for ODP members to parse and reproduce the representation of pen, right, after just having drawn something. As Streak notes, what our bodies know how to do is also what they're able to see. Non-signers will generally have experience with whole body actions and handling motions, but not have personally performed the kind of linguistically complex uh, mimic-like behavior that deaf signing poets um, use. Manu developed his communicative strategies over a lifetime, almost entirely spent interacting solely with non-signers and without a shared conventional language while Shakya grew up immersed in a linguistically rich deaf signing network. It's perhaps unsurprising then that Madhu's pantomimic strategies align with those the authors attribute to the mimes who perform for hearing audiences, while Shakya's align with the wider complement of strategies, like transfer of size and form, employed by poets who address audiences of signers. Yet when addressing the ODP, as in this example, a group understood to have spent most of their lives with and as non-signers, Shakya's narrative strategies 
closely resemble Mario's. Indeed, even as ODP pedagogy encouraged others to use standardized NSL signs, Rohan Shakya and other instructors recognized from their own experience communicating with non-signers that rather than being unmediated and ahistorical, elders' quote-unquote natural sign strategies are grounded in predictions about what kind of conventional experience would likely be shared with the people they wish to address. Drawing on such overlapping experience allows for the performance of telling by showing that would be interpretable to particular audiences. And deaf signers often extended this kind of accommodation to one another, as seen as Shakya doing when he's addressing the ODP group. Attention to this dynamic has potential to both underscore and complicate the difference posited between signing that is quote, structured in accordance with the logic of signs and that which is governed by uh, spatial and temporal logic of actions that are being represented. Sign making is a type of action. And while addressees are best positioned to parse visual actions that they have had experience enacting, such experience isn't static, but always ever accumulating. ODP pedagogy then creates a setting in which elders are given an opportunity uh, to accumulate embodied experience, parsing and producing standard NSL forms represented in Shakti's images, such that mutual engagement with these linguistic signs can increasingly be drawn into the natural signing strategy of drawing on shared experience to make meaning together. To conclude, most, likely all, deaf Nepalese share the experience of having to bear the burden of transparency, engaging in perspective taking that allows them to predict what actions will be interpretable to those with whom they don't share a common linguistic code. When successful, such interactions are mistaken as evidence that signing isn't language, but emerges from the visual contours of the world, again to quote Ray. This misinterpretation both reflects and reproduces a common ideology, dichotomizing language and image, and clustering each with essentialized qualities that are likewise taken to stand in opposition. It was against this background that deaf leaders identified an imperative to legitimize NSL as language. Shakya's illustrations have provided the focal point around which these efforts have been organized, even as the dictionaries in which these images appear show only a narrow segment of the linguistic practices that characterize fluent signers' meaning-making practices. NSL was in this sense presenced for some audiences by the formal poetic and language ideologies according to which dictionaries are constituted. The quality of conventionality, so fundamental to the linguistic, comes into being through such imagistic practices. And this is no less the case for spoken languages, as Persian approaches to understanding language and semiotics makes clear. Further, more obviously image-based forms of communication are not natural, but fundamentally depend on finding shared conventions on which mutual understanding can be built. Exploring the semiotic processes operating across these kinds of communicative practices, those which are thought to be relatively more linguistic or relatively more imagistic, undermines simple attempts to dichotomize them and helps us better understand the complex ways that people make meaning together. Thus, as much as Nepalese consider it a moral imperative, to quote Friedner and Custers, to provide all deaf Nepalese access to standard NSL forms and networks of sociality organized around them, as the second half of this paper has suggested, other forms of meaning making were appreciated in the ODP as well. And by incorporating pictorial image making into my own methods for analyzing ODP narratives to better understand how NSL pedagogy articulates with elders' natural signing, I've tried to respond to what Sicoli likewise describes as a moral obligation of researchers who attempt to represent and understand language. Namely, that we should seek to represent the actual elements and arrangements that enter into ontologies of human communication and not privilege one mode of language. Expanding the modalities and genres through which we represent embodied, situated instances of language use can help linguistic anthropologists better meet that obligation. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. For example, I'm currently here working toward a longer graphic ethnographic piece, uh, drafts of which, such as these, and again, these are just drafts, um, I'm workshopping with uh, local, the local deaf community, and, and the English text that appears here, I'm hoping to also translate into Nepali. This approach is part of a broader, emerging graphic anthropology. The field has been characterized as an anthropology that embraces all forms of line making uh, in order to understand the material world and the semiotic world, I would add, not as being composed of completed objects, but rather as part of unfolding cultural processes interwoven with uh, actions and behaviors. 
this shift to multimodal output in anthropology will be, I think, very important for linguistic anthropology. As Mark Cipolli has pointed out, traditional print formats for books expect the written word and, and articles, uh, expect the written word and privileged representations of human action that can neatly be spelled out in the single dimension of a text line. Such technologically mediated habits of representation have impacted what aspects of language practice have been predominantly analyzed and represented by linguistic anthropologists. Additionally, our scholarship has often been seen as impenetrable, technical, and siloed. It is a technical field. I've tried, but surely been only partly successful in purging jargony kind of talk from, from this presentation. So apologies to the extent which I've failed. <laughs> um, and adding to the range of modalities and genres through which we can communicate can provide more opportunities for others to engage our work. I'm currently benefiting, for example, from the greater interest my deaf friends in Nepal are taking when my work uh, research output is in this kind of graphic format, even as I recognize, and as this talk has hopefully made clear, uh, that presenting work as, as drawings and images doesn't make it universally accessible. Um, but rather, people engage images in different ways depending on their sensory capacities and social backgrounds. Now, I'm hardly alone in this kind of project. Graphic scholarship has been rapidly growing, not only in anthropology, but in other fields, challenging the hegemony of text in the production of knowledge. Uh, and there I'm quoting from Theodosopoulos. The, the, uh, Much of this work has taken place in fields related to medicine, uh, such as the multidisciplinary works in graphic medicine. Some of this material plays not only with modality, but also genre, as the graphic novel Lissa, for example, in which two medical anthropologists drew in their research to create a fictional narrative that exemplified the dynamics uncovered in their non-fiction data. These shifts in modality and genre have also opened the door for new kinds of collaborations between scholars, artists, and people who share their knowledge with researchers, as exemplified in Stacey Pig and Sham Kanoor's recent publications regarding infrastructure and road building in Nepal. These shifts, as Theodosopoulos puts it, quote, bring to the fore once again dilemmas about ethnographic representation and, I'll add, participation. Of course, these kinds of modality and genre shifts don't single-handedly solve long entrenched problems about barriers of access to scholarship and academic careers, but may be components of creating an anthropology and other disciplines that not only provide more access to existing modes of knowledge production, but more crucially, can be radically transformed through such broader engagement. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions and feedback. <laughs> Thank you, Eric Azin, for this wonderful, uh, very insightful, and to me, very new, uh, you know, uh, kind of topic uh, that you highlighted in the talk. Uh, uh, I might be sharing some of my thoughts, my reflections later on. So, uh, I think we can now uh, go for a discussion. If you have any you know, comments, questions, and suggestions, please feel free to you know, tell me. We have some time. Uh, uh, just through uh, my with you. It would be better if you could also identify yourself, like introduce yourself to uh, Rika. Thank you. The, the floor is open for discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think excellent presentation and a kind of new uh, sir, can you, perspective. Sorry, can you introduce yourself? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Abhindra Vandari. I am presently a field student in the uh, Central Department of Anthropology. I am quite interested in anthropological research. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, presentation, a new perspective, and a stimulating discussion, I think, uh, it, it is great so far. Uh, I see uh, that, uh, first of all, I mean, um, I have some observation from the content perspective. I mean, I was, it is really encouraging and it's really interesting from the uh, populations who are a bit older and the deaf people. I think, I, think you, I think it is one of the critical areas to explore how they communicate and how they live and how the socialization process goes on. From that perspective also I find it quite, uh, quite useful and interesting. One of my curiosity is to, um, you know, uh, from images to science, science to uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, you know, communication of the language, whatever. And there are certain transformations, a transitioning, you know, 
So it is curious, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm quite curious how that transition uh, uh, faces some sort of challenges in terms of meaning and communicating from one to another. Are there any inherent challenges faced by these uh, people or the experience that it has? I think it would be interesting to know. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's a great point, and I'll just respond really quickly. Yes, sometimes, so here when I'm talking about scaffolding is going from something that's considered like a non-linguistic image reproduction to things that are, that might convey this sense of like a, a climb, right, from less to more linguistic. And while that might be true in, in terms of the, the, the landscape drawing to some of these other activities, in general, I think one of the things that comes out of this work, particularly when you look at the full range of resources that fluent signers use is that it's not moving away from the imagistic and into the linguistic, which would imply, you know, a dichotomy that you're just kind of climbing through, right? Um, but rather that that full range of ways of making meaning get incorporated into the linguistic practices as opposed to abandoned, right, as you sort of progress away from it. Um, and so I'm glad you bring that up because that's not that notion that you're progressing away from, from the use of images is what I would want to to suggest, but I, I could see that it might happen. <laughs> uh, namaste, my name is Kola, so here's my question. In Tractatus, Wittgenstein wrote, the limits of my language means the limits of my thought. One can think of entities that cannot be objectified. Is Wittgenstein's statement true for sign language? Or can Sign language limit the way one one thinks about the physical world. I think, oh, I think um, as regards both spoken and sign languages, there are ways in which the particular uh, habits of thought built into uh, habitual forms of representing the world might have an influence on the way people think, but. At the same time, um, as regards both sign language and, and spoken language, um, I, I, I wouldn't perceive um, those particular forms or grammars or structures as sort of a prison that prevents other forms of, of thought. And so in fact, one of these things we learn from taking a wider view of semiotics, right, meaning-making practices that, that apply to both linguistic and, and other forms of meaning-making, is that we, we do have a wider range of making meaning in the world than just those that are grammaticalized. Um, and so I think that would be true of both spoken and sign languages. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mom. Hi. <laughs> are those people, like, are those two people saying we ran out of milk for the tea? Are the two people up there saying we ran, we, we, we even ran out of milk for the teal? The teal? Oh. For the tea. Okay, that makes more sense. It's an image from uh, Stacey Pig and Sean Kimmore's, uh piece about road building and infrastructure. So um, this is just one panel from that larger work, but I think it's, it's talking about the sort of stakes for specific people about having road access or not. So things like how easily can you get milk? Ah. Cool. How about you introducing yourself for others? I'm Sylvia Dillaway. I'm 11. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jeremy Spoon. I have a question about the relationship between signing these visual images and school. and. How much has like the increase in Western style education kind of co-fertilized with signing and created? I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel how much does the gap that exists for folks from different social classes and their access to education influence signers? And how much do you see those folks using graphic images or organic signing that's created within their own group versus these, the official sign language that they would learn in school. Um, I'm completely ignorant to urban context in Nepal, so I'm, I'm curious about this interface. Yeah, I mean, 
it's certainly the case that access to sign language medium schools is going to be a context in which um, the conventional recognized Nepali sign language signs are going to be taught. Although, frankly, often in those schools by hearing teachers whose command of the sign language is rather different than fluent, fluent deaf adults anyway, right? So you get a lot of variation. Um, I think there, are, there have historically been uh, social spaces where deaf people spend time together, like deaf associations and clubs, that cross-cut some of that access in terms of like, did you get to go to school, didn't you, etc. And in those spaces, there's been a real ethos of uh, inclusion, right? So trying to make these standard forms that have been important emblems of the recognition of Nepali Sign Language as language available to as many people as possible, but also uh, a recognition and appreciation of the, the wide range of uh, signing strategies that people are bringing um, into those kinds of spaces. So you don't get a lot of, um, in my experience, I mean, there's, there's certainly questions about who's had access to and how far they went. Yeah, right, and how far yeah. they went, right, how, how far, um, not all of the schools go to the same point, for example. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a lot of variation, but at the same time, again, in dedicated deaf social space, it's a real ethos of inclusion. Am I getting your question? I think so. I'm wondering if it's like a hegemonic discourse versus the culture, because education is so unequal in Nepal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, in terms of, just like how people are creating a sense of belonging and community, yeah. and how are they talking to each other? If they did, are they learning from each other? Yeah. Are they bringing stuff from their their right. own culture to oh, yes, this yes. group? You see what I'm saying? It's like because we have one broader discourse, right. like the Nepali language, right. and then we have these like sub cultures within. Yeah, I mean, so Nepali sign language in some of my earlier work, as Janet had mentioned, Janet Jay had mentioned, had more to do with sort of the, the politics or the language politics of how Nepali sign language was being, what signs were counting as standard, um, how that was interfacing with the sort of complexities of claiming a sort of an ethnolinguistic identity, particularly during the war. Um, and so those dynamics were at play, they're certainly shifting post war. But, but despite the fact that those kind of sort of hegemonic, hierarchical ranking of language and social type that exists in the state did get imported in some ways into deaf social context. They have very much been um, countered by this sort of accommodation ethics, yeah. right? Where um, deaf Nepalis are generally very used to accommodating what's going to be interpretable to others, and they do that for each other yeah. in a way that does kind of counteract that hierarchization that's possible. Yeah, it seems like that's a, it's a resistance against it, mm -hmm. and there's the cooperative learning happening. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. And probably through these, also the graphical representation. Really interesting. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Amar Bikin. It's a wonderful uh, presentation. I can you talk uh, a little bit uh, about the pedagogy, uh, especially uh, how they develop their uh, pedagogy and uh, what is distinct about uh, the pedagogy? Uh, sure, and in some ways, Chiyoji might be able to speak better to sort of historically how it was developed. I'll, I'll give my brief understanding, but do please feel free to correct me or add on if you wish. Um, so, so some of the structure of um, learn the signs from the books, reproduce the narratives, and things like that, I've seen in other um, Nepali sign language pedagogical settings. So schools for sign, or classes for signers in the associations, for younger signers, for hearing family members, in early instruction in the sign language medium school. So there's a real through line through all of this. It's adapted for the elders, um, given the general understanding that older people who haven't had access to language will need a lot more time, right, with, with certain processes than, say, children. Um, and I think the, the images um, are already a part of all of this pedagogy, right, the imagistic representation of the target things people are learning. But I think additional image making was is seen here in the ODP more than you see in other Nepali Sign Language teaching contexts, partly, partly I think, through Kritika Shakya's um, influence. He was one of the participants in shaping this program. Um, and it, you know, and that's partly because of the way it supports, I think, broader language learning, but also partly just about having an expanded kind of opportunity to socialize, 
right uh, and, and enjoy together. Um, Shu, is there anything you would correct about that? Shuji, thank you. <laughs> Before I forgot, uh, for, uh, sorry, I for, forgot to mention earlier that currently Erika uh, is Erika Z is a Fulbright uh, visiting scholar uh, in our department, department of Central Department of Anthropology. She's here. Uh, she's uh, you know as a Fulbright scholar, she's uh, helping us. Uh, I mean, Central Department of Anthropology and Anthropology uh, HU to strengthen uh, the linguistic anthropology course that we offer to our masters uh, in the masters program. It's a, com it's a compulsory you know, uh, required course. So, and none of us uh, in, in the department and where it is being taught right now have a formal training in linguistic anthropology. So we thought, you know, uh, it would be, you know, uh, very, very helpful for us to have her here. And, you know, so that's why she's here uh, for, uh, since October, uh, late November. October, end of October, but the, the safety had, you know, kind of like a get, uh, get away and end the winter vacation. But we already have, a, uh, you know, a one workshop and there is a, you know, series of other workshops and classes, uh, particularly for uh, faculty and, and also for PhD students. Uh, I thought this is very important to mention. Uh, any? Or are you going to do anything to add, or like you know, anything you have missed out, or you know, like add like, or maybe in general, what's what, you know, what are you doing right now? I mean, like how about I mean, your research work? Well, I mean, I touched a little bit on on that in terms of um, the effort to to uh, produce work that takes the form of a graphic format, and and hoping to workshop that um, more and more with deaf designers while I'm here. Oh, I also noticed that added there was. Um, I, uh, when I was talking about sort of ethics of accommodation, another way of putting that, um, Mara Green, who also does work with deaf designers, puts that as um, commensurate, uh, like commensuration. So that's just another technical term. Um, that's a way of putting it that work to make meaning across uh, difference, right, as opposed to necessarily always insist on the reproduction of one particular form of doing meaning. Um, but, Yeah, I mean, I just really grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, really grateful for the opportunity to work again with colleagues who helped me so much while I was an undergraduate and starting off in my career. Uh, so thank you very much, John. Um, and, and yeah, and the opportunity to work again with deaf designers, particularly to work on um, the ability to, to draw uh, research notes, right? Ideas about what what am I seeing right now as I'm here in the field and have that be this sort of object around which I can you know, get feedback and get my perspective, right? Is my perspective the same as, as designers that I'm representing? And having different kinds of conversations um, have been more easily facilitated through this kind of approach I've been discovering so far. So I'm really um, you know, eager to see how, how this goes. Uh, thank you, uh, Just before uh, you know, we uh, end this formal presentation, a uh, few things that I, you know, I was when I was uh, listening to the presentation, I mean, obviously I'm not equipped to with all this I mean, theoretical thing uh, discussions uh, she mentioned in the her presentation. But you know, uh, what was interesting and very insightful for me was to see, you know, the new role of uh, anthropologist here. Like you know, she's not just participating, but now she has to draw. You know, so using her drawing uh, as a way of representing uh, what do we call like. You know, representing her, what she observed and what was going on. Uh, so now the use of drawing, of the pictorial image to represent the ethnographic story is, is very interesting and very insightful. And I was also having a thought when she was using the drawing, uh, how that drawing uh, is more effective or less effective in terms of using, for example, photographs, which I would have done because I cannot draw, uh, and then using videos, for example. How, uh, how would that be very different than showing, uh, for example, mothers, you know, all these gestures about long gesture was, you know. Even if you look at the, you know, uh, 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 
images, you can also uh, understand the story, and you can, and, and you uh, we do know the sound that coughing uh, and the nose, blowing of the nose, you know, and once you know because it's a part of what we you know generally do in Nepal. So that what you call like you know the graphic eth uh, uh, ethnography and and linguistic anthropology. I think you know it's a uh, the I think what uh, is very uh, innovative and also very insightful is uh, the expanding scope of you know, linguistic anthropology and anthropology to bring art and, and art history and other in terms of learning about uh, communicate. I think that was very, very uh, insightful and useful for me and, and something that I will, not, I will not be able to do because when I draw a frog, it becomes like a buffalo. So, you know, so I'm, I'm really poor at, uh, at, at anything that is you know, graphic. Uh, but uh, having said that, you know, uh, I think this will also be. Uh, I, think, I think your work uh, will also inspire many, like inspiring art students uh, to take anthropology and to do ethnography, and use her and his, you know, uh, picture, uh, uh, you know, representation. Uh, when now we have become so much like you know sucked up into like you know use of you know social media like TikTok and other things you know quick things uh, for representation. I think you know uh, uh, the use of this graphic ethno uh, ethnography and graphic uh, representation is something uh, um, as as you have said something in you know CCP and uh, Nepali uh, anthropologist Sam Kumar has already like you know they have collaborated uh, on this project. Uh, I think these are very, very immersing and very promising, uh, promising uh, field. And, and also, like, thank you very much for adding you know, more, opening up more, uh, more scope for that. Uh, and uh, social science Bahat organizer uh, also asked me to do another uh, job. Uh, I mean, that's one is to present uh, you. Uh, uh, what do we call like you know, in Nepal, the token of love and appreciation for your you know it's. A talk, but also like you know, uh, your talk imprinted. Uh, imprinted. So uh, this is on behalf of the social science uh, And thank you, uh, thank you everyone for for joining us, and thank you, uh, thanks to social science Bar for this uh, for this opportunity and the event. Thank you everyone. Thank you.